Morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Faith Bible Church. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the blessing of your son. We are thankful for the people who are, who are here and ask that you guide and bless this gathering. We ask that you be with us today, and we thank you for Jennifer and her team stepping up to bring us together. We also thank you for her ministry and pray you continue to be with her. Amen. Amen. I want to thank um, Jennifer and Unstoppable You Ministries for putting on this conference. As a young man way back in the last millennium and living out in the sticks in Virginia, I would often hide and jump out from behind different places scaring folks, especially after dark. One of my poor aunts used to fuss at me saying it took her twice as long to get to the barn for looking where I might jump out. Well, I'm glad none of them have been shown what you'll see here today. Although, perhaps, had they, then I would have only done it one time, learned a painful lesson to behave myself. But we here at Faith Bible, we believe in Jesus, who was sent to allow us, despite our many sins, despite our many issues, to go to heaven. We at Faith Bible also believe that we live in what we term a fallen world, a world that is filled with sin and with evil. Contrary to what you may have been told in the past, we here in this church do not believe we're perfect. Instead, we know we're not. Through our doors pass a lot of folks that have issues, including even ourselves. As Jesus once put it, he was here for the, well, for the sick, not for the well. One of the real blessings of being a member and getting to know Jennifer, as well as some of our other re outreach groups, this church believes in working in the world. No holy huddles, no waiting on miracles to occur by themselves. Rather, we are here to serve. Some of our ministries, like Unstoppable You, really get in to tackle some of the biggest issues threatening our society. <clears throat> Back in the 1980s, there was a movie, The Wife and I Enjoyed, Jake Speed. It was really corny, and in fact, I'm not even sure it was as high as a B-level film. Anyway, the gist of the story was human trafficking. Two thugs kidnapped two women who were, like, who were later sold as sex slaves. At that time, we had no idea this was real especially not in Western Europe and sure not in the United States. That was something that happened in third world countries. I've since learned it is a very real problem right here. The fact is we do know we live in a fallen world. Bad things happen to good people all the time. The truth is God gave people free will, free will to do good or free will to do bad. Unfortunately, there's, there's a lot that use that free will to do bad and evil things. Well, this church puts into action what we were told in the book of James. Faith without works is dead. Our faith in Christ should prompt us to work and to serve. Through ministries like Unstoppable You, again, we tackle many of the issues facing society, issues that others are afraid to tackle. We have many other ministries that deal with various issues facing our, that same society. All, folks, all these folks work with love in their hearts for our neighbors. We look further back in the Bible, and we see the example of little shepherd boy David, who was able to slay the giant Goliath with a slingshot. A couple of years ago, our pastor delivered a sermon on the subject. While many of us think that this was luck or God intervening, the fact the pastor reminded us was that David was a shepherd. He was many night, days and nights alone protecting the flock against many things, even bears with nothing more than a sling or a spear. The bottom line is he was prepared before confronting Goliath. Thanks to Jennifer today, while you may not learn the skills necessary to slay Goliath like David did, you will learn tips and techniques for being aware of your surroundings and better protecting yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you so much, Kirk. So we start, thank you all for coming uh, to this Unstoppable Youth Safety and Self-Defense Workshop. We started a few minutes late, but that's okay. We will get back on track. Please help yourself to the beverages you can eat in here. This is the fellowship hall. So you have fruit, soda, water, pastries. So again, please help yourself. That is provided for you. Um, and then we will have an opportunity to visit the vendors. But again, I thank you all for coming because it speaks volumes that and to see so many Young girls, thank you, parents, for bringing your teenagers. I want to give you a round of applause. Yeah. 
So to keep the, I want to thank Faith Bible Church, all the leaders who support Unstoppable You Ministries, and like Kurt said, um, just all the different ministries that we have. Is I'm grateful to be a part of this church um, for many years. Jennifer Edwards uh, is the director of the Calvert County Crisis Intervention Center. She wanted to be here. This is her presentation, so I'm not taking this whatsoever. I'm just filling in. She had a conflict schedule. Again, please take notes. At the end of this workshop will be a panel discussion. So if you have any questions with, from the presenters, write them on a note card. I'll have my military volunteers. Go Navy, thank you. <laughs> I got five Navy volunteers here. I love them so dearly. <laughs> and so they'll collect the uh, index cards and that way everything could be in decency and order. So this is Love is Respect. Again, this is Calvert County Crisis Intervention Center. This is a presentation that they uh, put together. So we'll go to the next slide. What does a healthy relationship look like? So, you know, you have people having fun. Um, it's def you know, these are good examples. Eye contact and playful um, public display of uh, affection, that type of thing. And then next slide. And so we're going to go over some statistics. About 72% of 8th and 9th graders are dating. Nearly 1.5 million high school students nationwide experience an unhealthy relationship. Unhealthy behavior typically begins between ages 12 and 18. 12 and, 18. and only 33% of teens who were in an unhealthy relationship ever told anyone about their situation. So parents... I need you to examine yourself, how you communicate to your, your children, and what example are you providing in your home. So this is not just for teenagers, but it's also to keep it real about how are we setting the example. What does a healthy re relationship look like? Respect changes. What partners want in the early and in a relationship may change over time. Respecting and valuing such changes in your partner is healthy. Differences, we are all unique. I'm not going to you know, go through each thing, but again, I want you to be mindful of what a healthy relationship looks like. We create the normal in our home. So if it's dysfunctional, if it's toxic, then your child will pick that up and believe that, well, mommy hitting daddy or mommy, uh, daddy hitting mommy, that's normal because then he, she says he loves her and everything goes back to normal. But that's actually a three-phase cycle of domestic violence. So again, we have to be mindful of what a healthy relationship looks like and what do we want our children to um, take on board. Definitions, rape, forced sexual intercourse, um, both psychological coercion as well as physical force, sexual assault, a wide range of victimization separate from rape or attempted rape. These crimes include attacks or attempted attacks generally involving unwanted sexual contact between victim and offender, date rape, non-consexual sexual intercourse by a friend or acquaintance. Why are we going over this? Because people have it jaded. They, you know, well, because she was unconscious, you know, that doesn't mean she wasn't consenting. We have to understand what these terms are and have that dialogue with our children. So that way they know how to conduct themselves within a social setting parties and such. We are not going to be there 100% of the time with our children. Again, we set the example. Having these conversations, you being here at this workshop speaks volumes. Stalking individuals are classified as stalking victims if they experience at least one of these behaviors at least two separate occasions, making unwanted <coughs> phone calls sending unsolicited or unwanted letters or emails, following or spying on a victim, 
showing up at places without a legitimate reason, waiting at places for the victim, leaving unwanted items, presents, or flowers, posting information or spreading rumors. Be smart about date rape and came up with the acronym. Stay in public places. Meet your date at an agreed upon destination. Always carry a fully charged cell phone. I know I can be guilty of it. I'm constantly on my phone and the battery is dying. But if I was in an emergency, now I'm jeopardizing my situation. These seem like common sense things. But yet these issues, when you read the headline news and national news, locally, state, these smart uh, situational awareness ideas are not being followed. And what watered the seed for this workshop to happen, by a show of hands, how many of you saw on the national news there was a young lady about 18 years old in New York who was fatally stabbed by a couple of teenagers and she wasn't very far from her college? Okay, that was in the national news. That broke my heart because more than likely she was coming off of public transportation, maybe had earbuds in, not paying attention to her surroundings, and probably eyes on the cell phone. So again, we must be mindful of situational awareness. And then also, again, date rape. I can't tell you, I praise God for his mercy and grace because I was in a social setting as I was at a party, a house party, at a club, sat my drink down. Big no-no. And easy for someone to slip something in there. Respect your right to say no. Tell friends and family where you'll be. So that's smart. Well, these are some statistics uh, going through the different counties. Maryland rape by county, that's 2010 to 2012. We'll pass that. Psychological implications of rape and trauma. Not everyone displays the same reaction. If you're watching SVU, I'm an SVU, you know, uh, I love that show, but not everyone is crying and hysterical and everything else. There's trauma, there's that PTSD. So they're going to feel shame, self blame post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes, our people outside of our military can experience PTSD. Feelings of severe anxiety and stress, depression, flashbacks, sleep disorders, eating disorders, disassociative identity disorders. Maybe they regress to being a child. Distrust of others, uneasy in everyday social situations, anger, feelings of personal powerlessness, substance abuse issues, thoughts of suicide. Why is it important to understand this list? Parents, you have to pay attention. Your child could be giving you signs, but if we are so self-absorbed in our own adultness and we are not educated on these issues, we will not be able to help our child process what they have experienced. There has to be that trust and that dialogue so again, let this be conversation. And for our teenagers at this workshop, you're, you may see your parent as Charlie Brown's teacher. Maybe they're harping on these issues. Wah, 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 wah. Well, guess what? I am a student social worker. I graduate in May with my master's in social work. You have many other experts who are going to pour out and into you who will explain the same thing. So if the St. Mary's County Sheriff's Office and a Larry Penn and, or Thomas and so many others who will be talking about situational awareness, then clearly your parents are not crazy. Well, maybe. I don't know. That's between you and them. <laughs> but they're on to something. Okay? They're on to something. They're trying to protect you. Stalking. There are several signs that are indicators of stalking behavior. And we discussed this, persistent phone calls, constantly calling and hanging up, damage to your home, car, or other property, waiting or showing up at workplace, leaving unwanted items. Go ahead, Sarah, we discussed that. 
Every year in the United States, 3.4 million people are stalked. People between the ages of 18 to 24 experience the highest rates. Why do you think that is? They're out of the house, they're like, woohoo! And I'm partying it up, I'm in college, right? Yeah, they're in college. If you are in immediate danger, call 911. Obtain a protective order that makes it legal for the stalker to, um, to not come, uh, illegal for the stalker to come near you. Remember to save all evidence such as text messages, voicemails, videos, letters, all the unwanted gifts. Great thing about cell phones, you got that camera feature. Take a picture of it. Save it. Okay. Behaviors that may put you at risk for date rape. Being alone with someone you don't know very well. Not having a backup plan for how you are going to get home. An instinctive bad feeling about a situation you find yourself in. Drinking too much alcohol. Not having fully charged cell phone. Not having a means to pay your own way. Leaving your drink unattended, which I spoke of. Accepting drinks from people. Um, particularly if the drink tastes or smells funny. People who don't listen to you or show respect. A date that habitually tends to negate your opinions and feelings. A guy or girl who insists on coming into your house when he or she drives you home. Unwanted touching. A date that pressures you to, into drinking, drugs, sex. Anyone who would say, you would if you loved me. I wish I had this information when I was younger. And I'm keeping it real. Anyone who displays hostility towards a gender or tends to verbally degrade or stereotype an entire gender. So that is the presentation. Um, Ms. Corita Myers, she is representing the Calvert County Crisis Intervention Center. Um, if you have questions about this presentation or in general, feel free to again drop, uh, jot them down. I will be your moderator for the panel discussion. So, that concludes that. Again, please help yourself to the beverages and food. Okay, so now we're going to bring up... Um, Next, I have my dear, beautiful friend, Alary Thomas. She is an independent damsel in defense pro. She will be talking to you next in regards to teen safety and awareness. Many of the information, much of the information you hear is going to back up all the other presentations. And if you're on your cell phone, you have contact, please in, con tell somebody, hey, you need to be here. You didn't, um, registration help with the food, but we are not going to uh, shut anybody away if they show up at the door. So please feel free to have them come. So without further ado, please give a warm round of applause for Ms. Larry Thomas. Yay! So you have 20 minutes and I'll be your timer. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Jennifer, for always including me in your events, for believing in me, for trusting me to come and talk to your audience. I'm going to put my things down. And I really started to just rip up my notes that I had because... J Jennifer had everything, everything um, that I wanted to cover. Um, again, uh, my name is Ellery Thomas. That's Ellery like Valerie, or as my husband always say, like celery. Um, and I enjoy talking to people, especially young people, about safety, about self-defense, about situational awareness. Um, I grew up in a home where my dad was a law enforcement officer for 22 years with the um, D.C. Metro Metropolitan Police Department with the K-9 unit. So we had the special, he was part of the Special Operation Division, which means we had the bomb sniffing dogs. So way back there in the 60s and 70s and the um, early part of the 80s before he retired, so our dog was trained to sniff out bombs, so my dad had the presidential detail. So everywhere that the president went, my dad had to go ahead of time with his crew so the dogs could sniff out and look for, um, for bombs. Um, so early on, I thought I wanted to follow in my dad's footsteps. 
I thought I wanted my career path to be also in law enforcement. But instead, I took a path in banking. Thought maybe it would be a little bit safer if I helped protect people's money um, <laughs> instead of protecting the world. But I found Damsel in Defense after about 25 years of working in banking, um, on and off, because I took time off to, to raise my um, three children. Um, my youngest is 20. I have a 22-year-old and soon to be 29-year-old three grandchildren. In May, I will be celebrating my um, 32nd um, wedding anniversary. So, <laughs> again, when, when I found Dams on Defense, I was like, oh my gosh, this is my chance, finally, after all these years that I can give back, that I can have my part in helping society and helping women to help themselves and, them, and their families stay safe. So I, I did some research on the company, and at the time that I found Dams on Defense and their mission to go out, equip, empower, and educate women on safety and self-defense, and through the part of our proceeds that we're able to give back to organizations who are helping survivors of domestic abuse, sexual assault, and we've also partnered with safe houses that are helping get girls acclimated back into society once they've been rescued from sex and human trafficking. So this past July, we rescued 10 girls during that month. It was awesome. We're on our goal to rescue 12 more. So we're doing some big things. I've had the opportunity to go over to Mexico to do some mission work uh, with Dams on Defense. Um, eight years ago, around the time, I found Dams five years ago. So, but eight years ago, I was diagnosed with an incurable autoimmune disease. I went through a deep depression. I thought and was told that I was going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. So when I found Damsel, this is an outlet. You know, I can get over my anxiety. You couldn't pay me to talk in front of a room full of people. So I just thank God and give him the glory for just giving me the strength to even do this now. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So again, some of the things I want to piggyback on that Jennifer was talking about um, situational awareness is extremely important. Again, not having our heads down in our phones. I'm so guilty myself at times, but I have to catch myself. You know, walking, sometimes I walk in the mornings because the doctors told me I wouldn't be able to. So sometimes I get out and I walk in my neighborhood and I bop into the music, but I only have one earbud in because I want to be able to listen out if someone's coming up behind me. I want to be able to listen out for emergency vehicles, for a dog, or anything else. So that's part of being situationally aware. Coming into this room today, being situationally aware is locating the exits. If something were to happen, how can I escape? What is the nearest route of escape? What about a barrier? What is something I can hide behind, something I could get under? Again, if something were to happen. That's part of being situationally aware. One of the things also that Jennifer had mentioned about you know, going out with your friends, whether it's a party, a sporting event, after school, be aware of your surroundings, landmarks, street signs, vehicles that are parked nearby. If, you're, if you drive and you're coming out of Walmart, Target, in the evening, wherever you may be coming, always be cautious, too, of what's parked next to you. Okay, if it's that big old van with that sliding door on the side, it could, a matter of seconds somebody could snatch you. Go in, back inside and ask for an escort. They don't mind. Get in on the passenger side and climb over the seat. Okay, just, just certain things to be um, aware of. Because when someone's looking to do you harm and they're sitting back praying and watching your move, they're looking for someone that maybe mm, don't have the potential, or look like they have the potential to fight back, they don't have the means to fight back, or again, they're just not paying attention. So having that cell phone charge, like Jennifer mentioned, extremely important. When you leave, try to travel, we hear this all the time, I heard this growing up all the time, you know, try to travel in pairs, in groups, that's important. It's important because maybe if you're not the one to get away and that friend get away, they can get help, they can give descriptions, tag numbers, or whatever. So again, I'm also going to um, show some, um, some tips, 
Um, as far as some of the products that we offer on Food Dams on Defense. Um, but again, another thing with situation, being situation aware, when you go to restaurants, movies, again, that sporting event, again, look for exits. Look for exits. Um, young ladies, when you're going out on a date, you go to a restaurant, the gentleman, he should never sit with his back facing the door. And I, I taught that to my son. When you're taking a young lady out, you always sit where you are facing the door. So if you, you can tell if something you know, unusual is occurring or you know, just paying attention. So I spoke at um, Salisbury University, where my son is a sophomore now, um, in October, leading up to homecoming. Talk to them about safety on and off campus. So anyone in college yet or on your way to college, think about going to college? Okay, <laughs> I, see, I see a couple of hands. So it's very important. What I challenged, what I challenged the students to do during my talk, and I gave her out a prize, um, I had, I had a PowerPoint that time. I didn't have one today, I'm sorry. But what I challenged the students to do was the first person in the room that could find me the campus police phone number got a prize. So they all pulled out their phone numbers and they're Googling and they're trying to find the campus police phone number. So now everyone in the room had the campus police phone number programmed in their phone. That's extremely important. So when you think about that when you're going off to school to have that phone number um, programmed um, in your phone. Again, we talked about well-lit um, areas. If you're waiting for a ride, you know, try to um, be in a well-lit area. If you're out somewhere and you think you're being followed, go into a well-lit establishment. Go into an open establishment. I don't care if it's a pool hall. I don't care if it's a 7-Eleven. If you think someone's following you, get into a well-lit area, police station, fire station, somewhere to, um, to try to get help. I'm also going to talk about, um, I'm going to look at my time too, Jennifer, because I'm clocking it. You're good. Okay. Minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, also, would Jennifer share a story about date rape? I'm going to share a story. It did happen to me personally, but someone very close to me. And it was my sister. And what happened when she was about 15 she decided with a friend to skip school, didn't know that that friend was setting her up. Her best friend, who they dressed in like, they would wear twin outfits, people actually thought they were twins, thought they were, they looked so much alike that I showed my son when he was about 10 years old, this friend, I'll call her Debbie. That I showed him Debbie's picture in, in an old yearbook. And he immediately he thought it was his aunt. Wow. That's how much they looked like. They, they were so close. But my sister thought she could trust this friend. So the friend was dating an older guy. So she was going to skip school to hang out with this older guy that day. My sister didn't know all the particulars. Okay? So when she got to wherever they were going to hang out, there was another older guy there waiting for my sister. My sister, like I said, she was about 15 when this happened. She did not tell this to anybody until she was 50 years old. 50 years old, because she carried that all those years that she thought was her fault. It was my fault. I should have been in school. I shouldn't have skipped school that day. Had I been where I was supposed to be, it wouldn't have happened. She had, and not only at the gym, I didn't call him a gentleman, the creep. <laughs> That's right. You know, I got to catch that. Went to the same school, so she had to see him every single day. Wow. Every single day. She didn't want to tell. She was too embarrassed to tell a soul. So, again, fast forward to her being 50 years old. The gentleman, this time the gentleman that she was in a relationship with, encouraged her to seek counseling. So she finally sought counseling after 35 years of carrying that. So know your friends, know your friends. If anything has happened or ever happens, God forbid, it's not your fault. That's right. It's not your fault. And please tell someone, find that safe person that you can tell. 
Um, so in my last few minutes, I'm just going to quickly um, talk about some of the products and feel free during your break to come over and um, talk to me at my table. Um, with Damsel and Defense, again, through the sale of our products, we're able to um, get back to the mission of equipping women, again, giving them safe shelter. So some of the products, some ladies have already been over to the table. I have on my hip right now, um, it's a coupaton. That's a martial arts striking tool. We call it a socket to me. And it's also attached to a breakaway keychain. So in the event that someone were coming up to me, no matter what you carry, always I had a discussion with one of the other ladies, have it in your hand. When you're exiting the building, when you're leaving, you're getting out of your car, no matter what it is, have it in your hand. You're not going to have time to go in your purse, go in your backpack, in your pocket for that item. So again, this is a breakaway keychain, and with the martial arts tool, it's made out of heavy aluminum, and it yanked off my belt loop just that quick, and I have access to my product. We have a pepper spray. We have a new pepper spray with shield technology. That shield technology has a GPS track. This was just released within the last few months. It's a patented design, only exclusive to damsel and defense. So if my son at school is in trouble, he's had a late class, he's parking, he's walking to his dorm, he's getting attacked, someone wants to carjack him, if he has his pepper spray out, he can dispense the pepper spray, or there's also just a button on the pepper spray where he wouldn't have to dispense it, but it would ping my phone and give me his GPS location. Wow. He can include up to five contacts in that phone. So it could hit, it could hit me, his father, his girlfriend, who's also on campus, a best friend, and his aunt, who maybe lives about 20 minutes from campus. It can hit all five of those people. Okay, our pepper sprays also have an orange UV dye in it, meaning if the attacker is sprayed, traces of that dye will stay on them for up to seven days. Okay, we have a full replacement policy. If you have to use our pepper spray in an attack and you file a police report, we replace it free of charge for the lifetime that you have it. And yes, pepper sprays do expire. So if you have one, check the expiration date. Because I always get people, you know, our age, Jennifer, I'm probably way older than you, but uh, <laughs> I get people my age, they come up to me, oh, my dad gave me one when I went to college. Like 40 years ago, you know, it's <laughs> okay. It probably doesn't work anymore. So definitely if you have one, check the expiration date that a uh, lifetime on those are usually a um, couple years. Um, also we have stun devices. Please check your local area to see if they are legal um, to carry in your area if there's no restrictions. Um, we have different styles of stun devices. We have another striking tool, which is a tactical ink pen. The tactical ink pen is called the human made concern. The end of it is jaggered, which will also capture the person's DNA. Hmm. So if you hit it with that end, give it a little twist, you get some DNA. Yes. <laughs> okay, again, you found your police report, you're turning this in as evidence. And what will happen? We'll replace it free of charge. So again, with your pepper spray, it's spray and get away. With a stun device, it's stun and run. So no matter what type of product that you have, that you carry, you know, always again have it readily, have it available. We have a children's line for those who have smaller siblings or as even some smaller um, younger young ladies in the audience. We have a children's line of books that are teaching young children about safety, about gun safety, about inappropriate touch, about body boundaries. Because unfortunately, 70% of the sexual assaults occur before a child is 17 years old. So it's teaching them at a young age. And my granddaughter's three years old. At three, I have three of them. One is two, one is five, and one is six. So at that three-year age mark is when we sit down and we start having story time and we start talking about body boundaries. We start talking about inappropriate touch. Okay, so it's through board games, through role play, it's teaching on children. So again, I guess I'm getting close to my time, but thank you all for your time, for your attention, for coming out. Again, if there's anything that I can help you with, assist you with, any questions, I'll be part of the panel discussion later. Again, come over to my table for additional information. I have handouts of safety tips 
that you can take with you today and also of all the products that we offer and carry. Again, thank you so much, Jennifer, for having me out this afternoon. Great information. Great information. Wow. Um, how many of you are aware about human trafficking? And it's happening right here in Southern Maryland. We're not immune, um, along with your larger cities. Domestic violence, homelessness, all these issues. Uh, Unstoppable You Ministries, we support, we provide information and supportive uh, resources. And we love collaborating with the community. So what I didn't do earlier, we have Damsel in Defense. We have the St. Mary's County Sheriff's Office. We have Glenn Miller with his Miller's Tang So Do Institute, Inc. I've been working on that. <laughs> Calvert County Crisis Intervention Center, Unstoppable You Ministries. Plus, I have my published book in speaking, Inspirationally Speaking. We have Trades of Hope. They have artisans around the country. Many of them are women who are uh, human trafficking survivors, and they make these items, and the compassionate entrepreneurs sell, sell the items and then return the money so that they can make a living and feel, get their life back. And then we have the Southern Maryland Center, there's Ms. Taylor, uh, for family advocacy. There's so many resources in and around Southern Maryland, I want you to know who is who, what they offer, and how to support. Um, I was told a story where, um, and I can't remember the location, but there was a young girl, she was going to the restroom in a mall, and she had her uh, friend that she was with, you know, hey, I'll be right out, just wait for me. There was somebody right in the next stall that pricked her with um, a needle where she began to feel drowsy. But prayerfully, she was somewhat in her right mind to where she was able to make it out of the bathroom. But you have, like Kurt said, a lot of evil people in the world. And they don't care how they get you. They will go by any means necessary. So again, it's important to have that buddy system in place and let people know where you're at. Um, then there was another uh, situation I heard where there was somebody in a store around the holidays and there was a guy taking this woman's picture and she didn't understand why. And as she was about to leave, she sees this van parked in front of the department store. Prayerfully, again, she had the wherewithal to not go out because what happened is she believed that the person that was taking her picture was sending it to the person in the van so they would know who to kidnap. This stuff is real. I went to see Blind Eyes Open, which was a Christian documentary about human trafficking. And they interviewed a trafficker who was in prison. And they asked him, how do you find your victims? And he said, well, he would go to the mall, and especially if someone is young and they're supposed to be in school, he would target them. And he would go up to them and say, boy, you're really beautiful. And if the girl looked them in the eye and said, thank you, then he knew that they were not targeted because they had self-esteem. Mm -hmm. However, if he went to another girl, said the same thing, and she looked down at her feet and said, no, I'm not, then he knew he had her. It's all about self-esteem. It starts in the home. Parents, please be mindful. Boost up your child, love them, and have these conversations. So without further ado, I'm going to bring up uh, Lieutenant Stephen Simons. He's with the St. Mary's Sheriff's Office, and he will be going over teens and social media safety. Please give him a round of applause. 
Do I need to switch out a mic or how is it still hokey? Okay, we'll go with it. Let's see George and I'll work on your PowerPoint. Thank you. While you guys are getting that stuff ready, I did want to introduce myself. I'm Steve Simons. I'm going on 20 years here in St. Mary's County, in the St. Mary's County Sheriff's Office. Uh, prior to that, I started off in Prince George's County. I've had uh, great opportunities to uh, listen to Valerie. Her dad was canine. I also had an explosive detection dog for about seven years. I've been in gang intelligence for about four years. I've uh, been in patrol. I'm currently assigned to special operations as the assistant commander, and I'm the Homeland Security Officer for the St. Mary's County Sheriff's Office. So, Valerie had a lot of good points. Great advice, as does Jennifer. Um, before we go into this, I just wanted to piggyback on some of the points that they made. Uh, situational awareness, I think, is often underrated. Um, confidence, the way you walk, the way you handle, you talk, um, having your uh, nose buried in your cell phone as you're going down the sidewalk. Because here's the thing, anybody in this room is susceptible to becoming a victim, including myself. Um, when criminals look for victims, whether you're a burglar and you want to break into somebody's house while they're on vacation, if you're going to rob a convenience store, um, it doesn't matter. Fill the blank in for whatever type of crime. Criminals need three things to make it happen. They need the desire to commit a crime. They need the ability, which is fortunately for us, not everybody has the ability, and they often make those lists for, you know, world's stupidest criminals, and it makes our jobs a lot easier to catch those people. Um, and you need the opportunity. We can't control somebody's ability. We cannot control their desire to commit a crime. But what we can control and what we can mitigate is their opportunity. We can uh, target harden ourselves, um, our workplaces, our homes. Um, so that's important to keep in mind, and it's really no different with cybersecurity awareness. Um, I borrowed a lot of stuff October last year with Cybersecurity Month, and um, I pulled some of these points instead of reinventing the wheel from InfoSec, who uh, work in conjunction with the uh, Department of Homeland Security. So I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence because as we go through these slides, you're going to say, man, I drove all the way out here to listen, uh, don't have a short password, or, uh, you know, very basic things. But even though this information, some of it is basic, and some of it you may have not heard, and that's a good thing, it's good practice, it's best practices, and it's also a good reminder, because we all fall into these mistakes when it comes to these certain things. So... Is the clicker or the pepper spray? I need to click the pepper spray. Yeah, Sarah can help. Oh, you're gonna click it for me? Yes. Thank you. Don't don't do that. So, real quick, just by a show of hands, and I think I know the answer to this, but I'm trying to prove a point. How many people at home have a computer with internet access? Just raise your hand. That almost covers everybody. Keep your hands up for me. How many people? have access to a smartphone with internet access, okay? Does anybody, and I haven't even gotten to social media, but does everybody pretty much have their hand up? I know there's a couple of young kids here that would be like, yeah, I wish I had a phone. Mom and dad haven't bought me one yet. But you will, and it's coming, and don't rush it. You can put your hands down, thank you. How about, is there anybody in here that does not have social media? Good, I'm one of those people as well. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, and I'm not, I'm not going to bash social media. There's a lot of great points to social media. If you have family that lives out of town, if you want to connect with old friends, there's a lot of positive uh, ways to utilize social media. Unfortunately, for as many positive ways, there's also a lot of downsides to social media. According to the numbers that I researched, there's over 3 billion people uh, with access to the internet, which kind of proves by the, the hand test here. Not everybody's a friend. 
when uh, Facebook was just getting started, I, I had friends and they're like, well, I'm up to 500 friends. I have 1,000 friends. I'm 10,000 friends. I don't know 10,000 people personally. I don't. And you need to be selective of who that you're, you're allowing into your inner circle, into your friend group. Now, from a law enforcement perspective, social media is great. I use it all the time as an investigative tool. I mean, look, I'm far from a 23-year-old uh, blonde bombshell, but I played one online for legitimate purposes, and you would be shocked of how many people, how many people will, will, will befriend you. Um, I'm not running around posing or catfishing anybody. These were part of investigations for like gangs and stuff like that. But if law enforcement can do that, so can the bad guys, so can the criminals. Um, and their purpose may be a little bit different. I never understood why people said, hey, I'm going out of town. Excuse me. I'm getting over a cold, it's not the coronavirus. <laughs> So many pe people post their business online, they're going out of town. Hey, we'll be going for two weeks. Um, you know, this all goes back to situational awareness, there's steps, and this has nothing to do with computers, so I digress a little bit. I might be all over the place, but, but a lot of these practices, it's just, it's limiting that opportunity. So let's talk a little bit more about social media. And it's important, I think, especially for our younger um, kids in, in here and even, even the older people, everything is forever. Um, remember that when it comes to online, even these different apps like Snapchat, I've been in many arguments with my kids over the years. No, no, Dad, you don't understand. It disappears. Okay, but well, what if I have two cell phones? Can I take a picture? Oh, it'll let you know if you screenshot it. Well, that's fine, but if you want that information well enough or uh, enough, and I don't care if the person knew I screenshotted it, it can still go out there. I can't even keep up with the apps. You got Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, TikTok, which I'm not a huge fan of at all. Um, and, and, and also, we don't know where these apps are originating from. You know, a lot of, a lot of these apps are coming out of China. They have uh, back doors built in, viruses. Um, you really, really need to vet what apps that you're putting on and what social media that you're, that you're using. So, if we can go to the next slide, if you don't mind. And this, this is going to go back to my point. This is Faith Bible Church Today, the website. Pretty modern. I think it's a very nice website, very informational. Go to the next slide. This is from 2011, which actually, they were ahead of their times, because a, a lot of people were still using the uh, HTML back then, and it was very... Uh, gaudy, not gaudy, but gaudy. Uh, so they did a good job. Um, but it's all out there. Uh, it, there's a website, the Wayback Machine. You can plug any website in there and look what it, you know, take different snapshots over the years. Wow. So information you put out there, it's captured. There's no pulling it back. We talked about friends. Um, you don't need 10,000 friends. Maybe you, you pick uh, 10 or 100 of your closest friends and you're, and you're selective of what you want to share with them. <clears throat> locations, uh, it's my understanding that Facebook, and this is something that came out a few years back and they've taken steps to correct all this, but when you took a photo, it would uh, geotag and uh, everything on your photo. So it would give you the GPS coordinates. A lot of these companies started stripping it. But the point was, if, you, if you're posting something, and especially if your account is open to the public and it's not locked down, you're sharing more than just um, your, your photo. You're sharing a lot of metadata that's built in underneath. And if you know how to extract that data, it's very useful information. It can tell you a lot about somebody and their patterns and their habits. Um, most of those, I think Facebook, they started stripping that um, and giving you a little bit more preference. Speaking of preferences, make sure that you're going in and um, you know using those preferences. Uh, Facebook, and I don't have Facebook. Um, but there are preferences in there where you can tighten things up and you only share certain things with certain people. Most people probably, by default, just uh, share with everybody. It's open source. Facebook, by the way, is also one of the largest repositories of uh, photos 
in the world. Because when you sign those agreements, nobody's reading 10 pages of licensing. I don't. I don't even read it when I go to buy a car. I, I just, they tell me where to sign at the bottom, and that's what I do. But everything you, you post to Facebook and other similar uh, apps, you, you give up your rights. You don't own those photos anymore, where they can use them any way that they see fit. Test. Oh. So per permissions, when you install a new app, as most of us do, and, and those numbers are increasing, uh, the last I checked on the Apple Store, there's 2.2 million apps. Google Play used to have the lead. They're about 1 million right now. But if you're installing an app and it's a game that you're playing, you need to ask yourself, why are they asking for permission to my telephone directory, all my contacts? Why do they need to have access to my camera? Maybe there is a legitimate need, maybe there's not, but you need to ask yourself those questions so that you're not just hitting accept without knowing what privacy that you're giving up. I find it interesting, I have conversations, especially with the younger people, uh, for us older people in the room, I think maybe we take our privacy a little bit more personal. Um, if you're 12 years old and, and your whole life this is all you've known are Apple iPhones and the internet, I see, at least in my experience, that some people give up their privacy a little bit easier. And normally the counter argument is, well, it's not like I'm hiding, hiding anything, you know, what's it matter? Well, I would beg to differ. I think it does matter. You don't have to be hiding something to not want to give up your privacy. Um, you young people, you don't know what you're going to be doing as a career down the road. You don't know what might seem funny, you know, at 16, uh, holding up a bottle of liquor and a, a BB gun because you, 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 you think it looks cool. And it happens, trust me. We take calls like this all the time. I'm also in charge of the school resource officers. And almost on a daily basis, we're getting reports from the school that people are posting stuff online that really is inappropriate. And it creates quite a stir to the point where we have to come out and knock on your door and interview the, 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 the juvenile generally. We interview the parents. Do you have any access to weapons? We have to validate that threat and, and determine on what level are we. Is it just a joke that went bad? Or are they planning on doing something in the school the next day? It's very time consuming. It's very um, easy for those messages to get out to the public. Man, I could keep talking about this. We, we actually had an incident at one of the middle schools about two months ago, and it was based off of partial information. And a lot of parents, these weren't even students, parents were taking the liberty of asking questions. They thought they were doing the right thing. Hey, has anybody heard about this shooting that's supposed to happen tomorrow? Hey, I heard you shouldn't wear this color. Hey, it's like the telephone game. By the time it got around to the Board of Education and the Sheriff's Office, um, it had mutated so much that the messaging was just all over the place. And when we started peeling those layers back, it really could have been stomped out in the early stages. Um, and there was no credibility to it. But what it did was create a public panic for everybody in the community. And it's hard to get that messaging back once it's like a wildfire, once it goes out in the community. It's very, very hard to pull back. So these are all considerations. Parents, students, before you post stuff, please think, slow down. What, what are you, you going to post? And what implications potentially could it have on the community? Uh, this particular slide starts, uh, talks a little bit about scams, um, vaccinating your device, make sure that you're upgrading your, your operating system if it's on your home computer or uh, on your cell phone because they incorporate a lot of patches um, and that can help protect you in the end. It closes those vulnerabilities up that, and, and look, we, we, we may be talking state actors. I was one of the people that fell victim in 2015 to the 20 million uh, o OPM records that were leaked, finger, uh, fingerprints, um, family history, all these different things. Uh, I don't know if it was ever concluded that the Chinese government had um, aggregated that data and that, that stored it, but big data is big business. And that information, even if you can't use it today, may be helpful down the road. But it doesn't have to be China stealing your information. 
Um, it could be we talked about jealous uh, um, boyfriends or girlfriends. I mean, it could be somebody that you know very well that you're friends with today, that you have a falling out with tomorrow, and you've already shared your password with them. They can get in your phone. Maybe you put your, their thumbprint on your phone. These are all things that younger people especially don't consider uh, when everything's good, that that, that that situation could change. Um, or that you could be impersonated, or postings could go out that you don't know anything about that looks like they came from you. <clears throat> you, you skip slides on me? It's good. No, 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 no. I was done with that. You got to keep me moving because I'll keep going. How much time do I have, Jen? Six minutes. Six minutes. Okay. We'll push through. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on, on this particular um, slide. This just talks about passwords. The longer, the better. Um, you know, the, in the old days, everybody did it. Password one two three, A B C one two three, and I, and, and another slide. It's one or two ahead. I won't. Uh, I'll wait till we get to it. But it, uh, for last year, it has the top worst fifteen passwords. And I don't want you to raise your hand if yours is on there. But there's a good chance that somebody's is on there. We can go to the next slide. There it is. Twenty nineteen. Um, number one on the list, one, two, three, four, five, six. It goes up to eight now because a lot of requirements, they tell you you need up to eight characters. So, um, And then different variations, password, admin, um, they come and go. They change, but they're fairly similar for year to year. When somebody gets a password they can remember, might be a pet, their favorite car, whatever it is, they seem to hold on to that and they use it for everything. Guys, ladies, please don't use it for everything. I'm not preaching at you. I've done it. I've been there. We all know it's common sense, but we're creatures of habit, and it, it's just something that we do. The, the downside is if somebody figures out your password, well, I know what accounts. You probably have an Amazon account. I mean, we can go through with a uh, cast a wide net and probably get into quite a few of your accounts. Next slide. Two locks are better than one. Your, your, uh, your smartphones are going to this, so you have to, uh, maybe you put in a code and, and you have uh, facial recognition or you have a, a fingerprint. A lot of employers are doing this. Uh, sheriff's office is no different. I have access to databases that, and not only do I have to log in online, but they'll actually send a PIN, a code that comes to my cell phone. Um, those are obvious safeguards so that if somebody were to get my actual password, um, they would not be able to get the PIN. So two-factor uh, authentication, that's great. There's actually apps through uh, both Google Play and Apple that you can um, use two-factor and sideload you know, multiple accounts. Of course, there's drawbacks to that as well. If you lose your phone or somebody gets access to your phone, now they have all your accounts. We can go to the uh, next slide. Don't reuse passwords. That goes without saying. Um, I believe the next slide, we get a little bit more into uh, scams and, uh, and phishing. So let's skip past this slide. All right, so this talks about phishing a little bit. Does that, with a PH, not an F. Is everybody somewhat familiar with how a phishing scam works as it relates to uh, digital media, emails, social media? So I won't go into um, uh, a great deal of information on that. Um, the public is becoming more aware of these scams, but so are the people that are creating them. They're becoming more complicated. They're becoming more, I mean, there's some, some of them are very basic and um, not a lot of thought put behind them. And then some of them truly have a lot of uh, sociology and psychology and a, a lot of thought that go into these trying to trick people because as the public becomes more aware, they have to up their, their game. We'll go to the next slide. This just talks about updates. Let's go to the next one. So here's an example. Uh, you get this email in your inbox. It's from Costco Wholesale. Looks pretty, looks pretty, uh, pretty genuine. Um, even makes reference to a delivery order. Now, if I, if I don't go to Costco, I may know right off the bat this is bogus. I don't even belong to Costco. Delete. But if I go to Costco, and if I've ordered anything from Costco, it looks pretty legit. 
If you look up here, mostly it says from Costco shipping agent, manager at cbcbuilding.com. So sometimes those clues are built right into the email themselves. And if I were to look at this a little closer, I would say cbcbuilding.com. That doesn't sound like it has anything to do with Costco. Uh, that should be a huge red flag in and of itself. Next slide. Um, this talks a little bit about um, passwords auto-connecting to, uh, to different Wi-Fi networks. It seems like everybody has a Wi-Fi network now. Um, and that's a good thing because it's convenient. And I have Sprint, and I don't get very good service at all in St. Mary's County. This personal choice, another story with Verizon. But I take advantage of Wi-Fi, so I need to know what am I logging into? Is this really the Wi-Fi for Faith Bible Church, or is this somebody sitting in the van up the street with a mobile Wi-Fi spot that says uh, Faith Bible Church uh, extra speed? Because I'm going for the one that gives me better internet connectivity. So you need to be aware. Next slide. Again, this is just uh, more of the same thing. Lock down, lock down your devices. Uh, less is more. Don't don't carry stuff with you. I don't want. We have our whole lives on these phones. My dad will tell you. Last week, he lost a ton of pictures and stuff. And his really was just trying to upgrade his iOS, and he uh, went into a boot loop failure and had to take it to Apple. And they said, "Sorry about your luck." So not just somebody stealing your stuff, but make sure you're backing your important stuff up, your information, and that sort of stuff. So that was the last slide there. Um, again, I, I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence. Um, these are just internet and social media type of issues. We could extend these to telephone scams, to letters that you get in the mail. The important thing is to slow down. If something seems too good to be true, oftentimes it's too good to be true. A lot of these scams work by putting you on the spot or by uh, demanding an answer right now. Um, I've gotten calls, hey, this is the IRS, you need to, you need to send this much money on a green dot card or we're going to have the, uh, uh, the sheriff's office come by with a warrant for you. And I'm like, really? Tell me more. <laughs> and uh, so most people, they hang up the phone. They know. A lot of uh, criminals prey on the elderly because they're not, not all are as uh, techno technologically savvy. Um, and most times, at least the scam reports that we go take, most of the time people know as soon as they hang up the phone, they say, man, I was just scammed. Um, or as soon as they send the information for the gift card, oh, I shouldn't have done it, I was just scammed. But it happens. Um, it happens to the best of us. So just slow down and, and start looking at these things and locking your uh, passwords down and that sort of stuff. But. I think I'm out of time, right? Hmm. I'll leave it there. I will be at the table as well. Um, if you guys want to ask me anything, it doesn't have to be about computer safety. I'd be happy to discuss anything going on in the community with you. If you have any specific concerns, um, it's all, it's all uh, on the table. Just let me know. And uh, I appreciate your time, and I appreciate you having me here, Jennifer. Thank you. brother. All right. Um, oh, I think you have my agenda. Maybe. Thank Thanks. you. Outstanding. So what do you think so far? Lots of great information. For our next presenter, I hope you all are taking notes and writing things down on your index cards as we go through. But this next presentation is Self-Survival Principles and Techniques by Mr. Glenn Miller of Miller's Tang So Do Institute Incorporated. I was in the Navy for 21 years and thank you for that. <laughs> um, I thought, you know, heightened awareness, but when I talked to Mr. Miller, I actually, he taught me some things and I was like oh my goodness there's more that I still need to figure out so without further ado please give him a round of applause and pay attention to his presentation here you go Mr. Glenn Thank you.
told me all I had to do was... Yeah, you just... Yeah, just he's don't. He's going to use yeah. that. Okay. Yeah, you use this. You don't have to touch that. I got you. Yeah. Okay. My name is... This works? Uh, yes, it should. I can't hear it. My name is Glenn Miller. Um, I've studied martial art for over 40 years now. And uh, I have a, a small school that I have over in uh, Loveville, which has been over there almost 20 years. And in uh, 2013, we had a young lady murdered over on the bike trail over in Mechanicsville. And some of you might remember that. And shortly after that, uh, I had some uh, women in the community come to me and wanted self-defense classes. All of a sudden, every time something like that happens, it becomes a priority. So I gave uh, a lot of thought to that. And I looked at what happened there. And the bottom line to what happened there was there was a young lady running on the, tra on the trail and something happened uh, with, with a, a gentleman who... A gentleman. <laughs> so that's a social term. And uh, that's the way I'm speaking right now. Anyway, uh, he assaulted her. And the bottom line was he, all he did was take a rock that was on the ground and he beat her in the head with it until she was no longer with us. So I'm thinking about that and what martial art would have saved that girl's life. And in my opinion, none. Because the martial art is not made for that. The martial art is designed for social violence. Social violence. Social violence is something that happens socially that we agree to. All right. So. Somebody says something to you, you decide to say something back, and then it starts to uh, get a little bit more aggressive. And as long as you're participating in that, we call that social violence. Asocial violence, criminal violence, is violence that you're not agreeing to, you don't agree to. That's a completely different skill set that's needed. So if we have social violence, typically most of us know how to speak socially and we kind of can talk and get our way out of situations and things like that. That's a great skill set. And uh, a lot of what we have heard earlier today was situational awareness. That's huge because if you can avoid the asocial event, then you don't have to deal with all of that. So even when I'm over at the table, uh, and it's fine because I'm used to this, but social people want to know, you teach self-defense, what if somebody grabs me like this? What if somebody does this? It doesn't work like that. And uh, as a society, we look at it, and that's the way we think it, it works. So what I do is I teach only 18 and older. I only teach adults. And I do teach martial art. But I also offer s uh, seminars. <coughs> so what I have decided is instead of self-defense, I call it self-survival. Because self-survival is for life or death, asocial criminal violence. And that's what you're talking about, but you cannot view that or talk about it in a social context. I don't know if this is making sense to you. Most people have never thought of it that way. That's a real big uh, aspect to what, what we're going to do. So typically, my seminars go three to four hours, and I, we cover all kinds of things. Uh, I have about 20 minutes, so I'm going to try to hit on a lot of different points that I can. Um, but for the most part, that's the biggest problem is understanding what's happening. So typically, well, how did it happen? Why did he do that? How did this happen? Those are all social contexts, okay? Criminals don't care about that. They don't look at that. And it's just like looking at that event over on the bike trail. All I view is the event, not how it led up. Well, that's where all the situational awareness comes from. So for instance, uh, I look out in the parking lot, I love doing that, and you should always park in so that you can pull out. You should never have to back out of a parking spot. Right? You never want to have to back out. So if you get to a parking lot, just pull through. That way you're, you're always having an exit. You'll never see a policeman with his car pulled into a parking lot. I did today. 
An <laughs> example. Except, <laughs> except for today. Uh, that's why I, what you have the, uh, the availability to to uh, to exit quickly. Um, when you pull up behind the car at a traffic light, you never want to pull up to the point where you can't see their tires, their rear tires. Because if you, can, if you can't see their tires, you cannot turn around them if you ever needed to quickly get around. So little things like this is situational awareness, which should help you to be able to flee or avoid any kind of uh, physical altercation. Um, and that's a big, big, big part, and I cover that a lot in the seminar also. But that being said, um, we'll go back to self-survival. And what a lot of people don't understand either is they've got this scenario in their head on exactly how they're going to get attacked and exactly what they're going to do about it. All right? And I have yet to, to talk to anyone or see a news report where the person says, it happened exactly like I thought it would. That's not how it works. So that helps to give you an idea of the possibilities of where you're vulnerable, but it's never going to happen the way you think. So when I teach, I teach um, principles. I do not teach techniques, right? Because if somebody grabs you, grabs you any which way you want to practice, the odds of them doing that in a real altercation are very slim. And then what happens is you start to freeze up because, well, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So if you study principles, there's no issue about that uh, because it doesn't matter uh, how, they, how they decide to, to grab you, attack you, or anything like that. So uh, the criminal's always going to decide the time, place, and method. Time, place, and method. And they hunt. Okay? And they're hunting for easy victims, a lot like what you heard earlier. And today, the biggest problem is this. Uh, if you can avoid that, you've got to try to avoid that at all costs. Um, so I want to get to some terminology so, so it makes a little bit more sense to me. So we have social terms, and a weapon is a big social term, weapon. In self-survival, there's only one weapon. It's the human brain. That's the only weapon there is. Everything else is a tool. Okay? And tools don't function without a weapon, without the brain. So the other problem with martial art is we learn uh, uh, techniques to take weapons, weapons away from somebody that's trying to use, so a knife, gun, we have uh, ways to do that. The problem is you're looking at the wrong problem, right? The tool is not the problem. The problem is what's running the tool, okay? So <clears throat> when you study principles, the tool is kind of moot. It really doesn't matter. Um, and I'm going to uh, show you some of that, these principles here shortly. Um, But it comes down to training. It also comes down to training. So, uh, uh, Ellery's got some great products over here. Great tools. Right? Anybody carry pepper spray? Yeah? You ever, have you ever deployed it? That's usually the, the no is the usual response I get. You do not want to deploy that the first time when you're being assaulted. Right? right? So if you have a tool, you have to know how your tool functions. If you have a, a, a coupon that you're going to carry, you need to know how it functions, and you have to train with it. Uh, if you have a firearm, you, and I hear people all the time, I, have, I, I bought a pistol and I have it by my bedside. Well, have you ever shot it? Don't need to. It's, how easy, it's easy. You point and shoot. <laughs> I hear that. And that mindset is a problem, all right? And it's the same thing with your pepper spray. So I recommend, Ellery's going to let me do this. If you're going to buy pepper spray, you buy two, all right? One that you practice with, <laughs> one that you practice with, and one that you carry, all right? Because the other side is, is, if you deploy that, 
It's almost inevitable. You're going to get a good dose of it yourself. And you don't want to find out what that's like at the same time he does. She does. All right? So training. Training is a huge part of your survival strategy. I have helped various people over the years, and I've trained with various people over the years from all different aspects of martial art or even um, uh, police activity. One of the instructor, I helped an instructor once with a rape prevention class, and I'll never forget this because uh, he has to live with this and I don't, but it's still a big deal. I never forgot it. Teach, we taught the whole thing, and uh, it was great. Women took off, they leave, they think, I, I've got to, I, I know what I'm doing now. Here's what happened he had a student come back later, not too long after, and explain to him exactly what happened. And she was attacked and assaulted and raped. She said, I did everything you should, and it worked. It worked real well. Okay? He laid on the ground and he was screaming and yelling and in pain. And then he got up and finished what he started. And the instructor said, well, why didn't you run? And she said, you never told us to run. Wow. The way you train is the way you will perform. Right? Now, to us, we look at that and we say, the common sense would tell you to run. The problem is, when you are assaulted, you're under extreme stress. And when you're under extreme stress, you don't think. You don't think, you just act. And you act from your subconscious mind, which happens to be the part that gets trained. So in the martial art, we do repetition, 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 repetition. We're training the subconscious mind because when you get assaulted, you're not thinking. You're, you're just doing whatever it is that you have learned to do. Right? So, typically, uh, pepper spray. Well, so what do you do with the pepper spray? Do you shoot it at them? Do you shoot it? Where do you shoot it? Well, in the eyes. Okay. Have you ever tried that? Tried, have you ever tried to put anything in somebody's eyes? It's not easy. Okay? So it's training. You need training for these things. So my biggest uh, um, um, the biggest thing I can give you to, to you today is if you're going to carry a tool, please, please train with it and know everything about that tool and don't be overconfident because that's, that's not a good thing either. Okay? So, I want to move on, and uh, I'm going to get Mr. Hur to help me here. Some of you might know him. <laughs> Mr. Hur is uh, one of my longest, but well, he is my longest running student. He's been with me 17 years. Whoa. Wow. So, he, he, works, he and I work together a lot when we do uh, seminars and things like that. But, <clears throat> so, we work on principles. The first principle is to breathe. Now... As soon as you train, um, we good? 10 minutes, Ten minutes okay. 12, 12 minutes. The first part of training in the martial art is we teach you how to breathe. And that sounds like, who doesn't know how to do that? Well, you'd be surprised because as soon as we start training, people start holding their breath. And if you hold your breath, it's going to be bad. So one way we work around that, especially with somebody who doesn't want to train in the martial art because it is a long, slow process. All right, is yell, yell, or give a command. You have to breathe. You don't have a choice. Okay. So <clears throat> you don't want to say, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> Please stop, right? You give commands. You say, stop. Easy. It's very simple. You have to come up with your own command. Stop's always good. It's universal. Everybody knows. Something else that's universal is... This. Everybody on the planet knows what that means. Subconsciously. So even a criminal, you get a millisecond of stop. Okay? So, you never want to have your hands in a fist. Alright? You never want to have that. You always want to have an open hand. A fist can only do certain things. And the hand has how many bones? 27. 27 bones in each hand. 
So even if you were to hit somebody with this and you hit them in someplace hard, usually the skull, something's got to give and these bones aren't real big. Right? Hands are open. Your feet. It's very important. Now, I have my anatomical on the, uh, on the table over there, and I brought it today just so you can see. And if you look under the heart, there's a great big brown organ. Right? That's the liver. And it's on your, predominantly on your right side. So, uh, and especially females, for some reason, when they're social and they talk, they talk like this. Feet to feet. Okay. I people watch all the time. <laughs> this is not good. Because if I want to go at him at any time, he can't stop that. He's going to go straight back over with his feet like that. Uh -huh. all right? We have our feet point forward. Our balance is forward. It is not to the back. There's no way to, to, to uh, do that. Other than change your base. So, if I'm going to talk to him, I always want my right foot back. Okay? Wow. So that takes the front of my body away from him, number one. The other thing it does is it protects my liver, keeps my liver away from being attacked. If you get struck in the liver, is a very good possibility that you will be temporar temporarily paralyzed. You won't be able to move. And if you watch any boxing matches, it's not real popular anymore, but when I was a kid it was very popular. Uh, that was a, a real common thing. They'd get a liver shot and they would just freeze. And then without a referee, it wasn't going to go well after that. Okay? So, we always want the right foot back. We have our hands up. We're going to give a command. With my hands up, I can go up or down. With my hands down, I can't go anywhere but up, and it's a long process. Hands are up. What we also want to do, if you're going to talk to them, this is not good. Right? Because right now I've locked both hands. I can't get either one out. Not quickly. So if you're going to do that, maybe like this. Okay. This allows me to quickly, very quickly attack. Okay. I can get my hands straight out. All right. You want to lower your weight. So balance, the lower your weight is, the more balance you have. So when I step back, I always want to have a bend in my knee. Not like this. <laughs> but straight legs are not good. It's just, it's, there's no stability to a straight leg. So drop your weight. Uh, so if you had a little baby, some of you know, little brother and sister or something, and, and they want to be picked up, how much do they weigh? <coughs> not very much. If the same, per same baby doesn't want to be picked up, how much do they want? <laughs> okay? So, if you're going to be, you know, if somebody does, for, for instance, they grab, right. If I'm straight up, it's, he'll pick me up with no effort at all, right, and dump me. So as soon as I get, I got to lower my weight. All right? If you lower your weight, now we can start to move and start to do things. So, whether he had me in that position or whether I'm in this position, I want my weight, lower your weight. It's just something that you learn to do in, in your practice. Um, balance points. Can everybody hear me okay? Or do I? Okay, it's easier. All right. The human body is made, everybody's made pretty much the same way, and we all have the same weaknesses. So all you have to do is if you study the body, you know how to attack it if you need to. This is the strongest anybody's going to be, head on, strong. Okay? But we have what we call balance points. So I've got a balance point here or here. So if I was to go forward, I go that way, I can pretty easily move him. Hips are the same way, but slightly down. So rather than just push that way, I'm going to push down. Right? There's not much he can do about that. Principle is push-pull. That's a big principle. So if I can push and pull, he's really got a problem. Wow. He's really got a problem. Right? Push-pull. So. Uh, <laughs> That's all, that's all the time. He's a great one. <laughs> so he grabs my arm. My first instinct 
everybody's first instinct is pull, pull out. Okay, so he's pulling, I'm pulling. That's not push-pull. Okay, the principle is push-pull. So if he pulls, I push. Okay? If he pushes, I pull. Right, I pull. I pull, push-pull. Everybody good? This is key. You are always moving forward. So, Carl's there. Where do I want to be? There. Because if I was to hit him, and he's standing there, I'm hitting at him. Okay? I never want to do anything at him. So I want to be there. So I just go in and I want to be there. Which direction is he going now? Backwards. Is the body very efficient at that direction? No. Does that, does that make sense to, to everybody? So if you notice what happened, when he pulled, I went right into his area. Wow. I did not go into him, pull, because now it's a fight. And if it's a fight, it's competition. Competition is social violence. I don't want to compete with a criminal. Violence is defined this way. It's real simple. One person does it, and one person receives it. That's violence. Which one do you want to be? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. So it's not a competition. So he pulls, I come in, I hit him, and I, and I stop, and here he comes. That's a comp. I don't want that. So uh, there's a famous quote, General George Patton. No one ever defended anything successfully. There's only attack, attack, and attack some more. Okay? So what we say is we need to injure and injure and continue to injure until he is no longer a threat. Wow. That makes sense there? Yeah. Until he's no, so that's self-survival. That's not self-defense. Two totally different things. But you have to know which tool. So everybody has a fire extinguisher at home. Right? So... That's for a fire you can, think you can handle, a little kitchen fire or something like that. But if a whole room's on fire, what do you do? Run. Run. <laughs> yeah, and call the fire department, hopefully, because that's the tool for that situation. Okay? So in a, in a, in a uh, metaphor, your fire extinguisher would be for social violence. The fire engine is for self-survival. When the house is going to burn down, you need, you need a fire engine. If your life is in jeopardy, and it's life or death, you need self-survival. You do not need self-defense. It, it's the wrong tool for the job. Okay? So what I do is I teach seminars, and uh, I can only hit on some things today, but we do, we do hands-on where we... I make this look easy. At least that's what I'm told. <laughs> okay? But when you actually try this, it's not easy. Okay, it's not easy. So there we go back. Situational awareness. Avoid, avoid, avoid. I can't tell you any, any more than that. The last thing you want to do is have to engage with a criminal or anybody. Anybody. Okay? Because afterwards, you have two situations after that. One... You have the table over there that's going to get involved. And then the next time you have the lawyers that are going to get involved. Okay? And you don't want to deal with that. If you can avoid, you avoid. At all costs. Thank you. Yes. Outstanding. Oh, one more thing? Yeah, please. <laughs> please. This is also real, real, real important. Run. You always run. Run, run, always run. Now, where do you run? Away. To him. <laughs> yes, you run to safety. You do not run away from a threat. Why? It's a mindset. Okay. So if you're running to something, your focus and your eyes are on something other than this. So if you're focused on behind you, you're always looking, it slows you down. A mindset is huge, so always run to safety. 
Excellent. And now I'm done. Excellent. <laughs> we got a photo op here. Oh. Carl, you want to get in this too? You earned it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, keeping this going. Oh my goodness, what a wealth of information from Mr. Miller. So we have our Faith Bible Church. Um, he's part of our security team, probably the lead. This is Mr. Jimmy Francine. He's going to speak on um, safety and self-defense from a biblical perspective. Please give Jimmy a round of applause. If I can do this. So good afternoon. My name is Jimmy Francine and I am the ministry leader of our safety team at Faith Bible Church. So I'm going to provide a brief overview of safety and self-defense from a biblical perspective. Can you hear me without the microphone? Yes. yes. All right. So I am a former Marine military policeman and was a shooting instructor in the Marine Corps. Uh, I'm very familiar with weapons and their use. And originally that was the route that I was going to take with talking about self-defense and safety for the church. But we're going to find out that that is not where God led me when I started reading about this and started studying God's word about self-defense. That there is more to self-defense than physical weapons and military tactics. So let's start with the question of what is self-defense? Self-defense is defined as protecting oneself from injury or death at the hand of others. The Oxford Dictionary defines self-defense as the defense of one person's interest, especially through the use of physical force. And we're going to see that self-defense is not just physical. We've got other things that we talked about with the cybersecurity for your families with the internet. You've got emotional self-defense that you need to protect yourself from toxic relationships. So why is self-defense an issue that needs to be addressed by Christians? We should have an understanding of what God says and know how He feels about the matters we face in life. So I asked a Christian friend of mine, another guy that I work with, what he thought about biblical self-defense, and he responded with, aren't we supposed to turn the other cheek? So why did Jesus say that if someone strikes you on the right cheek, you're supposed to turn the other cheek to him? So Jesus was not saying that we should be punching bags. He's not saying that we're supposed to take everything that everybody throws at you. So when we look at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, and you put into the, you put the turn the other cheek verse in context with the scripture before and after it, you find that Jesus is talking about the act of retaliation against someone for their actions against you. That retaliation is the act of harming someone because they have harmed you. Retaliation is not self-defense. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 12, Repay no one evil for evil. Never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So we let God handle dealing with those that have hurt you physically or even emotionally in an unhealthy relationship. Self-defense is also not punishment. Most people have heard of this verse written in the Old Testament book of Leviticus of an eye for an eye. Everybody's heard of that. Or a tooth for a tooth. That eye for an eye is punishment. If someone does something to you, it's not up to you to extract that punishment out of them. Going after someone and attacking them because of a fight you had last week or because of something they said on Facebook is again... That is not self-defense. You are not to pursue that. Let God handle that. And if it's violent enough, let law enforcement handle that. This topic of safety and self-defense is personal to me. I am father of a 15-year-old young lady. She's a freshman in high school. My job is to raise her to be a good Christian woman, to know God, to know His Word. But I can't teach her what I don't know. So we are going to take a quick look at the different scriptures that give God's view on safety and self-defense and the defense of others. So if you have that skill set, the gentleman over there does, he can use that to protect you, his family, his friends. 
So don't run from danger just because it's not you getting attacked. If you can help a friend, help a friend. Your safety and self-defense needs to be taken serious in all points of your life. There are mental, emotional, and physical boundaries you need to establish for your safety. So setting boundaries is a great start to self-defense. God's words tell us there is evil in this world, and we do not fight against just flesh and blood. The things we can see that attack our physical boundaries, but we also fight against the spiritual forces of evil. So you're not just getting attacked physically. Again, you can be attacked emotionally. You can be bullied in school. You can be bullied on the internet, Facebook, people picking on you, shaming you. Those spiritual forces are the ones that attack our mental, emotional, and spiritual boundaries. So we have physical weapons and tactics that we use to fight man face to face. But what about self-defense we use to protect our mental and emotional boundaries? You know, who are we and who do we want to be? Do we want to be what the internet wants us to be? Or do you want to be the person you want to be? Studying God's word and being in prayer will help you fight in that spiritual attack. Talked earlier about having self-confidence. Be confident in who God made. He made you. The New Testament book of Ephesians, chapter 6, tells us to put on the armor of God so we can stand against the tactics of the devil and hold our ground. It tells us to gird your loins in truth, God's truth of right and wrong. To tighten your belt. You're getting ready. You're, you're preparing for the fight that Mr. Miller's talking about. You're turning your body. You're getting it. Put on the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation. So you're protecting your heart. You're putting on the helmet. You're protecting your mind. All the things that are going to come in and attack you, the bad relationships that go after your heart, bad stuff on the Internet that you see that attack your mind and what you think. So you're following God's word and God's will. You're suiting up for battle. So every good warrior back in the day, they also had a shield. So you hold your faith in God as a shield to quench all the flaming arrows and take those blows of the evil one. So picture yourself standing there. You got your breastplate on, your helmet, you're a warrior. You step back, tighten your belt, you got your shield. Everything is going to be on that shield. So lastly, you grab the sword of the spirit, that is God's word, and it can be an offensive weapon or a defensive weapon. When you know God's word and you're holding that sword, you can fight back the attack. Yes. You block it, fight back the attack. Just like you said, you want to keep moving forward. If you're steadily moving back, you're just getting beat on. But once you step forward and start attacking, you're going forward, you're going in the right direction. So you need to make a mental list you need Jesus' righteousness to protect your heart. You need his salvation to protect your soul and your inner self. You need faith that Jesus has done and will do his part to protect you. That's the shield that you hold up. And you need to know God's word, that sword that you can use to keep the attacker away. You have to know God's word and have a relationship with him, your heavenly father. It is comforting to know that I have a Heavenly Father, a God standing with me when I'm attacked. I know He is going to help me get through it. So God's Word will help protect us in a spiritual attack. But what does God's Word say about physical self-defense? There are multiple places in Scripture that speak of being armed and protecting not only your life, but you protecting the lives of others. Gospel of John tells us that there is a thief and that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. God does not want us to die. He wants us to have life and have it more abundantly. He wants us to live and he wants us to live for him. He didn't create us to be destroyed. He created us to have a relationship. So we need to be prepared for that thief. And there are multiple ways that we can prepare ourselves to deal with the evil in man's heart. First, you have to have good situational awareness and common sense. So common sense is not known by many. Even though we call it common, it is not common. But situational awareness, that's something that can be taught. Something you need to practice, something you need to study. 
following his seminars sounds like a good start. So in the situational awareness you avoid those locations, situations, and scenarios that would likely place you in danger. You take away that attacker's time and place. You, know, you can't change the method that he's going to attack, but if he's planning an attack and you want a jogging path at midnight, you don't go on a jogging path at midnight. Right. You jog during the day when there's a lot of witnesses, a lot of people, a lot of light. So don't place yourself in those dangerous situations. The first chapter of Proverbs in the Old Testament describes the value of wisdom and how, it, <clears throat> how easy it is to be hurt by hanging out with the wrong people and doing the wrong things. We had the story of Ellery's sister. Wrong place. She wasn't supposed to be there. Wrong people. Shouldn't have been with them. Do not place yourself in danger. Stay away from all those people that do not have your best interest at heart. Second, is you can arm yourself. Talked earlier about the damsel in defense. We had the less than lethal pepper spray. We had the coup batons, tactical pins. Arm yourself. Carry something that might get you that split second to run away. It only takes a split second to take somebody out, hit their eyes, hit whatever their lethal points are to get away. And it's not just you. I mean, you got a lot of parents. It could be you and your kids, you and your daughter, you and your infant. So we look at being armed, and we say, what does God say about being physically armed? What kind of weapon? What, you know, what do you have? So when Jesus sent out his disciples in Luke 22, Jesus told the disciples to let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy a sword. Remember that the sword was the handgun of the day. You know, that was the going weapon. So we think it antique, you know, antique now, but that was the Glock of the day. So this was the loving Lord Jesus telling his men to arm themselves and be prepared for the world's hostility. So good self-defense starts with being prepared. If you have not prepared yourself mentally, physically, and spiritually for an attack, you have a greater chance of being a victim. Just like we discussed. You can disable somebody temporarily, but if you don't have the mindset to run, they're going to get right back up and attack you again. The Old Testament book of Nehemiah describes those who carried burdens building the wall around Jerusalem were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. These men were prepared. They knew an attack could happen. They were in dangerous situations. They had weapons. And if you're going to be in those situations, prepare yourself. But also be prepared to use that weapon. You know, if you're going to take somebody's life, know that you're stopping that life. So it's a big thought of, if you're going to do it, you're going to have to deal with the consequences. So again, don't put yourself in those situations. Avoid all those situations. If you're not there, they can't attack you. So these men worked on that wall with the constant threat of attack, and they armed themselves not only for self-defense, but in possible defense of their families who were with them behind the wall that they were building. They were protecting others and protecting those that worked around them and with their families. In the military, you know, most of you know that when you're fighting, you're fighting to protect yourself, but you're also fighting to protect the guy beside you. These guys were working with others who were prepared to stand in defense of them. So I ask you to find a good group that is strong and will help you and strengthen you to fight off the attacks. Some people have that warrior nature, that call to defend others. They are those who have it in them to run towards the threat. They are your policemen today and your military members. But it could be while you're shopping or at school to physically be there to defend someone. You could be the one that saves someone's life to help them in their self-defense, and not just physically, but you could also help somebody establish those spiritual boundaries that they need to get their life back on track. So use your gifts that God has given to you to help others. If you know God has strengthened you to withstand attacks, 
share it with others so we can stand together in defense of each other. So as I mentioned in the beginning, our church has a safety team, a safety ministry, and we stand together. The members of the safety team help in a variety of ways to allow the pastor to focus on his job, to do his job, and teach peacefully on a Sunday morning. These members were picked because they are prepared for self-defense. They're prepared for the defense of the church, and they have to be prepared not only for a spiritual attack, but also for a physical attack. The team's prepared to defend the congregation of this church. So Jesus said, Blessed be the peacemakers. Always attempt to de-escalate a situation before it gets out of hand. To make peace. But be prepared to protect yourself if the situation changes. Know that there are some who are willing to lay down their life for you in your defense. And John chapter 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. But what about the person who places their life in danger to protect someone they don't know? So I ask, please do not take for granted what our police and military men and women do for us. And please be prepared to fight for yourself mentally, physically, and spiritually. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Oh, I got oh, go ahead. So, go ahead. I brought up a couple of things that I normally carry. Little go bags, everyday carry bags. You know, I prepare for a lot of stuff. I, I work an hour away from here, work long hours, come home at night. You know, D.C. was shut down when the Pentagon was attacked. Couldn't get home, couldn't get anywhere. So I carry stuff with me, purify water, stop bleeding, stop puncture wounds, start fires, signaling, you know, phone chargers, battery cables, whatever you need. Take that stuff with you. If you've got allergies, throw an EpiPen in here. There's a lot of stuff that you can look up on the Internet about little everyday carry bags to help you get from point A to point B safely. If you go something much larger, this doesn't look like a very tactical military bag. You can change colors, but you can throw water, food, extra clothes, a lot of different things in these bags to help you and your family get from point A to point B. So just a thought, look it up online, you have something to keep you guys safe physically. Throw a Bible in here, protect Amen. you spiritually. Absolutely. God bless you. General, we're going to have a photo op. Yes. Outstanding. Thank you so much. So my team now will bring the tables together. We'll do our panel discussion. Yep, right there. Then next we'll have Lieutenant Stephen Simons from the St. Uh, Mary's County Sheriff's Office. And please feel free if you have to give yourself some room. Yeah. So yep. And then next we'll have hmm? Ellery yeah. Thomas, Independent Damsel and Defense Pro. Woo woo! Then I would like to bring Mr. Jim Francis back up, Faith Bible Church Security. Round of applause. Well done, well done, well done. Go take your seat next to Larry. And then, last but certainly not least, Mr. Self the Self Survival Principles himself, Mr. Glenn Miller, representing Miller. Thank you so much. So, Institute Outstanding. So these are all the presenters that you saw today, to include myself, I did the team dating violence. And I'm just going to, because I don't want to have to give up Ellery bunny so ears much. or something. <laughs> Here you go. Okay. Thank you all for writing down questions. I'm your moderator, again, Jennifer Foxworthy. It's been recommended to not look at your phone to avoid the distraction. 
What about calling someone when you are walking alone and feel unsafe? Um, I'm not exactly sure who that could be directed to. However, um, Lieutenant Stevens, uh, Simons, would you like to yeah, I think it's address a that? And you guys have the mics if you need them, or if you don't, you don't have to. Test one two. Yeah, All right. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I think it's a great idea. My wife called me the other day. She said, "Hey, I'm heading to the ATM." But keep in mind, in those situations, it's your attention isn't diverted. I think you're more tuned in. It's supplementing your situational awareness to the fact that you know you may not be in the best area, or it would benefit you to have somebody on the phone. Um, so no, I think that's a great idea. I, I, I wouldn't put that in the same category as walking down the street and have, just being preoccupied. Excellent. Oh, please. Sorry. Good. And I also want to um, add to that. Um, my daughter, she works um, in a retail establishment and sometimes gets off late at night. And this one um, particular area that she works at, she has to go through a parking garage. So she'll have me on FaceTime. Um, again, she won't be looking at the phone, but she'll have the phone where I can see her surroundings and have the FaceTime open. Please. You don't actually have to talk to anybody. That's right. That's right. It's, it's a, a distraction. Mm -hmm. And the, the other, other thing I'd like to add is, if it's in your hand, it's a tool. Mm -hmm. okay, so it's a multi-purpose tool. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you for answering those questions. For for people. Uh, share tips for mothers to defend themselves when they're small, with their small children. I feel more more vulnerable with my kids. Um, again, um, yeah, y'all can take turns. We'll, uh, this is what I recommend: is you should have a previous conversation with your children, and they need to know that it's okay to run and leave mom. Mm. So they run, and when they run, they run in different directions, mm -hmm. and now. You can address the threat while they get go. You can take that another step further. Well, that's a whole other issue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, this is if you have children big enough that can walk or run. The other issue is you should, even at your house, if it's a, it's a fire or something, you should have a plan. Everybody not only is going to get out, but where are we meeting? Are we meeting at the house next door, the tree in the backyard? Where are we meeting? Because just the plan to run doesn't really a uh, whole lot of credibility. So, uh, I, would, I would recommend that. Now, uh, the question was, if, what if it's an uh, infant it's a or something? Then you have to understand that, you're, that you are vulnerable. And so you, you have to walk with that kind of thought process. Um, they're not going to be able to run, so you're going to have to deal with that. Go ahead, Larry. And um, another thing I spoke, um, talked about my daughter, my older, she has three little ones. And what she has on her key ring, again, I'm not trying to be salesy, but she has that personal protection product on her key ring. Um, when she has the little ones and getting into her van, you know, she puts them, secure them in first, and, you know, then they'll walk around and get in, um, in herself. But she does have that personal protection, uh, whether it's a pepper spray or her striking tool in her hand. I, I have been pepper sprayed by training. But not not because I'm a criminal, but right. <laughs> through training, and it is debilitating. You cannot do anything. You can't even keep your eyes open. Yeah, I remember the gas chamber and boot camp, and you they you, they force you to talk with you know your name, your last four, and everything. And by the time I was out of there, I was puking and crying and everything else. So yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, did any of the other panelists want to address that particular question as far as mothers with little ones? So I would say on the front end of that, all very good suggestions. On the front end of that, planning goes a long way. Um, so if you are you come out of BJ's and you're holding your infant and pushing a cart, leading up to that, you know, park as close by as you can. Um, other people underneath the well-lit areas. I mean, and that's not... A, a save all because things happen in broad daylight. But I think if you can minimize those opportunities, then you're better off. And then, you know, it, it, money is money. I mean, you have no guarantees, but in that case, you can't what if every scenario. But at the end of the day, 
the mother's safety, the children's safety, that's paramount. And everything else, the groceries can, they can go, your wallet, the money, it doesn't matter. Just get yourself out of that situation. Great information. Outstanding. And moms, park near where you push your carts back. Yes. Minimize that exposure time. So if you park one spot, two spots away from the cart, dump that cart quick, back with the kids, and get out of there. Okay. Great information. This is for Mr. Glenn Miller. What do I need to know to take your seminar? I want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah. I, if you go over to my table, I have some flyers there. It gives you, I have two websites. You can go there, read all about it, and uh, contact me at any time. So there's a contact on the website. Yeah. Um, it, it's possible. I'll, you know... Maybe we can host his seminar or something like that, Unstoppable Human Ministries, and kind of like a follow-up or something. I don't know, but we'll discuss that with you and the church. Okay. And I just wanted to add that I have taken Mr. Um, Glenn Miller's full course, and it is exceptional. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Outstanding, outstanding, outstanding. Um, this is for you, Lieutenant Simons. How would we vet apps? since you did the social media presentation. Do you have any tips on how they can, <clears throat> where to start or? There's a lot of research you could put in. Um, and just because something is popular doesn't necessarily mean that it's safe. With 2.2 million apps, it's, <laughs> it, it's difficult. Um, I always, personally, I always read the reviews. Um, I, not just the reviews on the app for the particular store, but I'll look online if it's something that seems sketchy. You can, um, as much as I dislike Google because of privacy invasion, it's a great tool. I mean, you can hit keywords, so I'll look up other reviews as well um, from a parental perspective. Um, I'm not, probably my job over the years has made me a little distrustful, so I'm always <laughs> distrustful of apps and and all those things. And again, remember what permissions they're asking for. And I would say the more permissions that they're asking, the more irrelevant permissions, I would start, my red flags would start start going up there. Outstanding. Did anybody of the other panelists want to add into that or? Okay, awesome. Um, we touched on this uh, earlier, but what should I teach my child, a five-year-old, to do in a self-survival situation? Do I teach them to run? And I think that's easy. Yeah. Run. <laughs> run. Yeah, run. Absolutely. To safety. Yeah. Um, this will probably be for Miss Carita and uh, Lieutenant Simons. So Carita, I'll have you speak on this first. What are the recommended steps to take if you have been assaulted or raped? Mm. So I mean. I know you both can chime in on this. Absolutely. Um, so the crisis center is located in Calvert, but we serve the entire Southern Maryland area. So don't feel that you can't give us a call. And it's 24 hours, seven days a week. Uh, we have services. Unfortunately, it's the after, it's the fallout after you go through all of this. Um, so we are here for um, trauma. And trauma is anything that has happened to you that has destroyed your, your being. So that could be a physical trauma, verbal, people can abuse you verbally, emotionally. So we try to put together the pieces. So it feels good to help on the back end, but we're here today, we're on the front end. So listen to what you know, your presenters had kind of shared with you. This is real life stuff. We see this every day. And we serve children and adults and families. And one of the caveats that people don't think about, we also serve the people that cause the abuse. Mm. Most of them come to us because the court says, get there. But um, we want to fix both sides. So if you have been abused, a lot of people don't want to say anything because they say, I'm, blame, I'm blaming myself. You know? But there's no excuse for abuse. Just remember that. So if you have been sexually abused, physically abused, it's okay to talk to someone. And there's a lot of young people in here. They always say, oh, I'm not going to snitch. I'm not going to tell anything. Mm -hmm. But if someone has abused you, tell. Go to an adult that you trust. You have teachers. You have officers. You have people that will help you. 
And if the adults don't know what to do, let me know. We have plenty of brochures over there. Our phone number is on there. It just takes a call. So if you have been abused, it's a process. And a lot of people don't want to go through the process. Sometimes you, you may not feel like, okay, the officer is here. I feel kind of weird. You know, something's not right. But if you report it, we have advocates as well that can go to the place with you and hold your hand and be there for you and give you resources. So there is help. And then there's a lot of legal things that go on with that situation as well. So protective orders, peace orders, all types of things. We train people to help to do that as well. I agree with everything she said. From an investigative standpoint, at least from the sheriff's office or a state police um, perspective for law enforcement, it, it's a difficult topic when you talk about sexual assault, you talk about victims, and there's a lot of reasons sometimes people blame themselves. Sometimes they don't blame themselves. It's just an embarrassing topic to talk about. Even if you don't think you did anything wrong, it, it's, it can be very difficult to tell somebody um, or to bring it up. There are a lot of resources. I can tell you the closer to real time from an investigative standpoint, the better. So it's not that we can't investigate a crime a week or a month or a year after the fact, but as far as getting all the facts, the evidence, um, a good uh, prosecution, as close to when it happens is the best because if you are sexually assaulted, there's certain evidence that will go along and, and they'll, you, you'll likely go over to the hospital for an exam. There, there's all these different things and they do feel invasive, but they're necessary for the investigation. And if, you know, a year after the fact, it, it, cases that can still be prosecuted, but it's a lot harder to go back when you're looking at potential clothing or uh, exams. I mean, that stuff is long, long gone after the fact. Um, and if you are struggling with reporting something, even if not for yourself, just keep in mind, people that have that type of behavior that are predators, it may not just be you, and it's probably not the only time. So if, you know, even if, if it's embarrassing to do it for yourself, think about all the other people that could benefit from you coming forward. Um, but there's no judgment. I, I feel comfortable saying from anybody up here or anybody in this room, I mean, there's no judgment. Don't be afraid. Um, and when even when we do interviews, we'll try to make you as much comfortable as possible. Um, we have, if, if you're a female, we have female detectives, female deputies, um, and and we do utilize uh, those deputies and detectives a lot just from for a comfort level. So, great job. Um, I'm glad that you brought that up. That the predators they just don't stop at one person. Larry, this is for you. What are local regulations, and possibly Lieutenant Simons, um, what are local regulations regarding carrying pepper spray, stun devices, knives, and etc.? Because we know that every state is different. So when someone comes to you and wants to purchase these things, what do they need to know? Okay, that's a great question. I thank you. Um, well, first of all, like with the pepper spray, legally you have to be 18 years old um, to carry a pepper spray. Um, with the stun device, again, it's based on your um, jurisdiction, your local area. Currently in the state of Maryland, and um, officer um, can correct me, sergeant can correct me, um, in the state of Maryland right now, Ocean City, has a restriction on the stun devices. Um, when I first started with Dams on Defense a little over five years ago, there were five areas which included Howard County, Anne Arundel County, um, Baltimore City, uh, Baltimore County, and Ocean City. So right now, I believe Ocean City is the only one that still has that strict restriction on a stun device. So a resident living in Ocean City can purchase one and have it in their home, but us purchasing a stun gun going over to Ocean City as a tourist or on vacation cannot take the stun device over the city limits. Um, knives, I don't know anything about because we don't sell anything that is um, lethal. And what was the other one? Uh, uh, striking, was it the striking tool? Uh, knives, stun devices, pepper sprays, etc. Okay, so I think, and again, with, with the striking tool also, we really try to keep it at 18. Um, the parent knows the child's maturity level, and a lot of times it's at the parent's discretion. 
I know when my daughter, um, the same one is in retail, she started work at a very young age um, while she was in high school. So when she worked, again, in retail establishment, um, closing the stores, getting off at 9, 9.30, she was driving at 16, and I gave her a pepper spray just because I wanted her to feel safe. Sorry, officer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, so it, it, it depends. I'm, I, I would definitely want to double check myself. Don't take this as the uh, gospel, no pun intended. But, um, so the, the sprays, it used to be concealed is a big thing in Maryland, whether you're talking about knives. So if you've ever been into the grocery store, you've been into Wawa, um, you see somebody normally like a construction worker and they'll have a, it looks like a sword, but a knife literally on their hip. It's not concealed, that's legal. You can carry that, in the seat, but that same knife down in your boot would, would be illegal to carry. So some of it is, deals with concealed versus not concealed. It used to be, and the laws may have changed um, for pepper spray, it, same thing, it couldn't be concealed. You see people carrying them on their keychains. Um, I would have to double check it, and afterwards, whoever wrote that, if you want to give me your contact info, I will get you the definitive on the conditions and what would constitute concealed or not concealed. Other things like brass knuckles, not, nothing on the table over there, but brass knuckles and those sorts of things are switchblade knives are certainly illegal, concealed or otherwise. I think it's worth noting though, and Mr. Miller touched on this earlier, without the training aspect, you don't necessarily want to introduce a weapon into a situation if you're not familiar with it. So you bring a taser in, for example, you go, you're stumbling with it. This isn't a, could be a man or a woman, right? Um, it, it, but you're stumbling with it, you're trying, and then all of a sudden it's knocked out of your hand and the perpetrator is picking it up and now they have the weapon. So you, you need to practice, you need to be trained, and, and you, you just need to know what you're dealing with, right? You don't want it to be the first time in you know, they have that little plastic clip, like when we get issued the OC spray, you got to take that plastic clip, otherwise it doesn't matter how hard you squeeze it, nothing's coming out on the other side. Absolutely. You, yeah, that stun gun, be prepared, because then I know I'm going to make them do the curly shuffle. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to work it out. I practice on Tom all the time. <laughs> oh, I know. I'm joking. Yeah. So, yeah. We got a number you can call. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now you know why I'm Exactly. Pray for my Jennifer, if I could, just a, an important difference, and I haven't looked at all your items on your table, but like, I've been to the farmer's market, and you have stun guns that are, you can buy for $10 that came with, you know, overseas, and um, I've actually been hit with one of those too. Uh, uh, not on the job. As a joke, somebody, and, and I can tell you, when it when it hit my arm, it was um, it's not the same as the ones that law enforcement carry the fifty thousand volts that are being distributed. That's that that you know, neuromuscular, and, and, you, and you literally you can't move because the closer those prongs are together, it may hurt, but it may may kind of be like being punched or stabbed in the arm. It's not gonna. It's not like the movies where they hit them with this stun gun and then they always go down and they're passed out. Just in case you guys are wondering, that's not the way it works. Even the ones we carry, it doesn't knock you out. As soon as that um, stops, it, it's done. It's not like pepper spray, there's no decon. So you may upset a few people, but if you're expecting them to just pass out, that's probably not gonna happen. Well said. Um, this is so fruitful, outstanding. Yeah, don't, you know, be prepared to make them do the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Okay, so um, a Larry or uh, yeah, Larry, how do you use the pepper spray? I know in the flyer we had the Z formation, correct? Yes. Yes. So, so that's what we um, our pepper sprays uh, will shoot 16 feet away, and we teach people to. Spray um, aim for eyes, nose, mouth. So that's where Jennifer was talking about the Z because we're going eyes, come back, nose, mouth. Eyes, nose, mouth, or the T is going to get the nose, mouth, and then the eyes. I actually tell people use any letter in the alphabet as long as you're going for their face. 
<laughs> exactly, exactly. So it, it doesn't matter. So that's effective. And again, uh, you're going to practice. And I tell people all the time, because with that flip, it's, it's a thumb motion. It's a thumb motion because it does have a locked position so it doesn't accidentally go off in your purse, in your bag, or your pocket. So just, just, practice, just practice flipping it. Because again, if it comes down to that, you're going to have to know how to use whatever product um, or tool it is that you're carrying. So practice definitely makes perfect. You go out, not on a windy day like today, oh my gosh. <laughs> but, but you definitely want to uh, wanna practice uh, using and flipping your, um, your pepper spray. Awesome. I have uh, basically two more questions, and then we'll wrap it up. And, you know, I understand if you have to go, go. But please, I want you to patron the vendors. So this one is, how do young people safely handle a date at a movie? Um, Karita, I know I was filling in for Jen yeah. on this. Um, I know it. Uh, 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 you know, is there a grip? You know, you know, well, like I'm going to speak from a, being a parent myself. My children are, uh, I think, 22 and 28 now, so I've raised two children. But um, first of all, dating. You have to talk to your parents about that. Mine is not going to date at all. <laughs> so that's the biggest thing. But I noticed um, dating for my children, they always hung out in a group, which was so much safer. You know, it wasn't like one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and sometimes you're not ready for that. Emotionally, when you get into dating, you're opening up a lot of things that you may not be mature enough to understand. Because as parents, we've been through it all. Like you said, you put it on the breastplate, your heart goes into dating. And a lot of times you're not even mature enough here to even take on a lot of the things that you're going to be exposed to. So first of all, going on a date one-on-one, -on -one, um, if, you if your parents agree and it's a safe place, I don't know what the age group, what the question is, but always let someone know where you are. Um, my children are old, older, they still give me their location. Whenever they're going somewhere, they turn on their location. Like it or not, I'm sorry, I need to know. So let someone know where you are. Um, sit in an area, I, I don't know if you agree with me, but don't go all the way over to the wall right. where you have no, you can't get out there. Mm -hmm. So sit on the edge if you can. Maybe the first seat in the aisle. So if we're on a date, sorry, your wife, hopefully. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if I'm sitting like this, that's the wall over there. I'm going to sit on the aisle seat. So if he does put his arm around me or whatever, I can kind of move away. Use your words. You know, set your boundaries way before you even get to the movie theater. You know, what is your expectation? Are we just going on a date? Are we just watching a movie? And when it's over with, where are you going? You know, you shouldn't be like, well, we're just going to hang out. No, there's no hanging out. We have to have direct information to your parents. So if you, if you go on a date, Keep yourself safe. Let people know where you are. And when you go in the movie theater, go to the movie that you say you're going to. Okay? So be honest with your parents. Communicate with them effectively because at the end of the day, they're going to be there with you. And they're going to have to, you know, take care of you. So lying to them and saying, we're going to the movie, and, da -da -da, and you end up not in the movie theater, but you're down the street somewhere and something happens, they're going to have a whole lot of questions for you, right? So let's just be honest and keep yourself safe. Outstanding. Did anybody want to piggyback on that before um, I have a question for Jimmy? Okay. Jimmy, um, you spoke on the biblical principles of uh, safety and self-defense. Um, how, how can the body of Christ further put... Um, support the community along with his congregants dealing with human trafficking and domestic violence uh, because we have to be honest those things are happening within our the four walls so from a biblical perspective how do we navigate that I would say you know, for this church, we have a, a great outreach to the community, and, and there's different programs and different ministries for that. Um, we also have Celebrate Recovery 
if you're on the opposite side of that and you need some help, you have that addiction or you have those thoughts if you're you know, possibly a predator or somebody that's abusive in a relationship, you know, you can seek help through the church. I would say as a Christian, and if you're identifying, you know, one of your friends is going through a toxic relationship or possibly putting themselves in situations where they're going to be, you know, trafficked, they're going to be prostituted out. You know, you need to address those situations and the people that they hang out with and, and call them back. You know, get them out of those situations. And one thing to do is, is get in a small group. Find that group of people that are going to help protect you, help be that self-defense. You know, find a mentor that knows God's word, and then it can help you and bring you closer to a relationship with God. You know, God wants you to have that life. He wants to build you up. You know, he, he wants to have that relationship with you. Just like most of you parents out there, you don't want to have a kid that's beaten on again and again and again. You know, you want that big figure behind you. You want that Heavenly Father to stand there and protect you. So come to the church. If you know somebody that needs that, bring them to the church. You bring them to a relationship with Christ. It's going to build you up. Contact Jennifer about having this workshop at your church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Unstoppable You, everything that we do is mobile. So we travel around the country with conferences, workshops, those things. So if this was interesting to you and helpful, reach out to me. Um, the last question is, is, will this video be available today? I would say visit our Unstoppable You Ministries table. Make sure that you uh, sign our notebook with your email, phone number, your name. That way when uh, Mr. Ted, when he, we put, compile all of this, we can... Uh, let you know how to um, access it, but it will definitely be on our website. Any last parting words from our panelists? Um, can you all hear me? I need a mic. <laughs> uh, one thing that I failed to mention, and as soon as I sat down back at, at the table, I said, oh my gosh, I really didn't finish the story. Well, with my sister and her so-called friend, of course, they were no longer friends after that. Um, three years later, after high school graduation, that friend went missing. Six months later, her body was found. Wow. That same boyfriend was convicted of her murder. Wow. 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 Okay, no more index cards and everything. Can we please give our amazing panelists?